Call the workshop to order at 4.06 p.m. Um, so I guess the floor is yours, Matt. Where do you want to start with, uh, Joan, I assume? Or? Yeah, we can use Matt. Okay, yeah, thank you, um, Don. Uh, tonight, we'd like to um, uh, focus the majority of the meeting on our technology budget. Um, and uh, to help us with that, we've brought in Joan Wright. She has a uh, PowerPoint that she'd like to um, use uh, to help her with that. And so I think uh, what we can do is go through um, she's right there with you so if there are questions that come up um we can you can probably uh, get her attention and ask those questions and then there'll be an opportunity uh to question um to, for questions at the end as well so So, yeah, I'll kick it right over to Joan if you're ready uh, to be able to come back and present uh, this year's technology budget, but also what you've got outlined uh, for your long term plan as well. All right, well, what I did prepare was pretty much the capital improvement plan as opposed to a lot of detail on the actual budget, but it will all kind of come together when you see my So on the next screen or the first screen, I did point out that there were a few good things that happened this year. You know, we're always looking for something good in 2020. So here's a, here's a few of them. We did get a large amount of new equipment in using some of the COVID funds. And it's the first year since I've been here in 1990s when I started, that we've been able to provide new equipment to so many of our staff. And we've even provided it to the ed techs. Crucial, you know, especially now in the, you know, distance learning environment, many of the ed techs are doing a lot of that connectivity, connecting with students via Zoom. That it was a, it was just amazing that we were able to get it into the hands of the support staff as well as the teaching staff. So that that's you know worth noting by itself. And then we have the opportunity to hand out hot spots to the families in Sanford. And this came from a pool of equipment that was given to us by the Department of Ed. They didn't they didn't ask for a lot of detail on what we would like. But they gave us something that works, so that's fine because we're in an area where Verizon has got a good signal. So we have at this point issued 176 hotspots, keep going up every week, so that families can get connected, even if they don't have good internet access at home, or if the family <coughs> phone, you know, the parent's phone is the one connection, and then the parent goes to work and leaves the child with nothing. This replaces that connection with the parent would have otherwise had had they stayed home. So that's a pretty good chunk of families, you know, that we can identify as having benefited from that donation from the Department of Health. Joel, real quickly, prior to COVID, how many high spots did we have like given to you? None. Yeah, we didn't have them to provide at that point. But, and at the beginning, before we really got these rolling, we thought some of the companies would step up, you know, like Atlantic Broadband, you know, Spectrum, whoever's in the territory would have stepped up and offered a deal, you know, where families that didn't have it but needed it, but we didn't see that from those companies. You know, GWI did provide us with an access point at Lafayette School, but that was a drive up. I guess that's what I was thinking about. Yeah. That's what that was. Yeah. And it just proves, you know, with 176 families that are using these now, it just kind of shows you that driving up to a location to try to get everybody to do their homework, you know, or, or join class wasn't a very efficient way to do it. So, so the hotspots are working out. Then in addition to that, we were able to get new iPads for the students in K-2 
and I'd have to reflect back on the Momentum project. If you remember Momentum from two or three years ago, Steve Boussier was kind of in charge of that at the time at Charles A. Lamb. All the training and all the work that went into that project has really paid off in how teachers are able to use iPads in the classroom. There was so much training that came with that program and you know strategies that that has really paid off in the K-2 environment where the teachers have shared with each other. So even if they weren't at Carl J. Lamb, you know, that doesn't didn't matter. We offered PD where they could help each other learn the same strategy. So K-2 is doing a really good job with iPads. Then in grades three through six, we do have Chromebooks. Only grade six is new because that was in last year's budget. I always try to get one grade level of new hardware per year. And last year it was grade six. So grades three, four, and five are all using our Chromebooks, but they are used Chromebooks that we handed down from the high school. So you know they've truly been used. In fifth grade, there's, a, there's about 60 Chromebooks that the state was able to provide to us. They are a, an entry level Chromebook. They don't have touch. It's not a tablet model. It's just a laptop, but at least it gave us a little leg up, you know, at the beginning. So that gave us a few more to put, put in grade five. And I do have a couple orders out still for two more grade levels of Chromebooks that we'll purchase with COVID funds, but the supply chain was so backed up that those have not arrived yet. So we've got 650 pending, you know, they'll come in and, and go into two more classes. The seventh and eighth grade MacBooks, this was, remember, a bridge year for us. So we're using the MacBooks that the state issued to us five years ago. And they originally were going to sell them to us at the end of last school year. But then they said, well, we don't really know what we're going to do for MLTI. So why don't you just keep them for another year and you can just have them? Well, it turned out they can't just give them to us. So they sold them to us for a dollar each. You know, so the students in grades seven and eight are using five-year-old MacBooks that are part of that MLTI program simply because the state didn't have a plan ready to go. Can you just tell me, what does MLTI mean? It stands for the main, it used to stand for the main laptop initiative. Oh, okay. But then they've changed that terminology to be the main learning with technology. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so. That was um, Senator King's legacy when he was governor. He started that. Yeah. And it was very focused on Apple equipment. And then, you know, as time went on, people started to question why why is that the only choice, the only option? Because we did, we went through laptops, then we went to iPads, and then we went back to laptops, or we had a choice. And you know, when Doug, when uh, Governor Page was in office, he said, "Wait a minute, you should have a choice." And even though very few people chose the other option, which is a PC, you know, it was at least a choice. Mm -hmm. So, so that so there's a new RFP out, and we'll talk about that briefly when I get to the five-year plan, um, because they should be doing something for us in the fall of 21. There should be a refresh of sorts. And 9 through 12 is all Chromebook. They have been for four years now. This will be the fifth year of you know, the 9th through 12th grade, all Chromebook. And we did have enough COVID money. We got an order from one vendor from Dell. So those went to grade 11. And we had already purchased under E-rate, some E-rate funds that I had, we purchased another grade level and those went to grade 10. Grade nine got new devices when they were in eighth grade, so they're in good shape. So the only grade that's, you know, still kind of using used equipment in high school is the seniors. So those eighth graders brought that equipment with them for the freshman year, right? Yes. Okay. To, to confuse things even more, it's usually seven. No, no, you, no, you lost me. Yeah. It's all good. Felt good after the question. But that's true. For one year, eighth graders had a Chromebook. Any other year, for the last 15 years, they both had a MacBook. But this one year that they were in the high school, remember, as eighth graders, 
we put them on the Chromebooks. And then they stayed with them and they became freshmen using that same Chromebook. And hopefully they'll graduate with that same Chromebook in their hands. So, go so the next screen. Well, Joan, uh, uh, before we go to that screen, do you mind explaining what E-rate is? Uh, I think that might be helpful for uh, listeners. E-rate is that federal program that you will see on all of your cell phone bills and many other you know, services that we purchase now. Utilities. The Universal Service Fund is usually what it's labeled as. And that money is collected and put into a giant pot so that schools and public libraries in particular can apply to have projects funded using that money. In addition to the application, you have to also qualify by having a free and reduced lunch percentage you know, at a certain level in order to evaluate how much of that money you're entitled to. So unfortunately, we used to be a little bit better than we are now. We're at seventy percent funding now. So if I apply for an app, you know, for a project, and I say, okay, I want to redo all the wireless at Carl's A. Lamb School, and it comes out to a hundred thousand dollars, I will only get billed for thirty thousand because we get funded at seventy percent. It used to be eighty, and even once upon a time, we even had a couple schools that were at ninety. Mm -hmm. But we won't have that again next year. So we're um, calculating everything on seventy percent funding. So that's so when Emerson closed, that was that was almost one hundred percent free and reduced. High free and reduced. That was in ninety. Yeah. So when we blended that school into larger schools, we in essence hurt ourselves a little bit. Kind of diluted. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay. So. And I think. Uh, one thing I asked Joan to talk about that for is I think it's important to point out Joan does an excellent job of whether it's what she gets from the uh, MLTI initiative or whatever it's through E-rate. She really leverages and stretches out those dollars and builds a budget that really kind of supplements that. And I think that's able to uh, kudos to Joan because that's that's been able to really help us out with a lot of projects to help us. Uh, get going uh, to move along so so now on the next screen this is the five-year plan you know financially <laughs> looking at it from a financial perspective and as matt had directed us he said you know just try to keep your your accounts as level as you can so we don't have this split at some point, or I, I referred to it when I was talking to Cheryl one day, I said, we're buying off a lot of new equipment under COVID. I said, and it's going to create a bubble at some point. You know, it's kind of like a, a mortgage, you know, with a balloon payment or something. You know, I said, if we're not careful. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's all coming in at the same point. So it's all going to age out at the same point. So we need to be did you keep them in a box for a while? Strategic, yes. Well, future well, there's some. They're on a truck. Or, I mean, new, but educated. Yeah, the, the 650 that we have received are either on a boat or a truck. Somewhere, <laughs> uh, you know, so well, they're not. They're they're in good shape. But what I did do, and if you notice on the the spreadsheet, the blue column or the gray or the highlighted column is the 21-22 budget year. And these are just capital items. So you know that my total budget is not 186,000 because it doesn't reflect salaries and a lot of supplies and other support items aren't considered capital. So these are just the big ticket items that we feel in the last five years or more. This is what I'm looking at. No, no, okay. no you don't have that don't on paper. Yeah. So, what I propose for this school year, the blue or shaded column is one gray level of new Chromebooks. And if you, when we get to the next page or that handout that we have, you'll see why we still need, even after all the COVID purchases we have made, you'll see why we still need one more gray level to stay in the budget. Then you'll notice that the staff devices have a known number for quite a few years. So you're looking across on the left-hand column, you'll see staff K to eight. 
and staff nine through 12, those two lines, they don't have any dollar amount associated with them because we replaced all the staff equipment this year on the COVID. Those should be good for five years. So those don't pop up again until 25, 26 funding year, where we should start. And we probably can't ever think about doing 500 new devices again all at once. But we can start you know, working our way toward it gradually. So I put in a dollar a month that would get us about 100 at a time. And we can keep the other 200 running you know, without any difficulty as long as we have 100 new ones to work into the system as we go. And then under still in the blue or shaded column, projectors, document cameras, and panels. What we will start to see is some of the devices that we currently have in Carl Day Lamb in particular. Now I'm thinking, it's hard to think about it, but Carl Day Lamb is now the old building. If you think about it, we are going to have to continue to replace their projector systems with this kind of a system or the kind that you saw at Margaret Chase and at the middle school so that they have the newer technology with the touch and all of the features that all the other schools have trying to keep things as equitable as we can. Document cameras always come up. We've gotten to a good place with document cameras so that we won't have to continue to buy those probably many more years. They should last a lot of years. They're, they're just a camera that connects to whatever device you have in the room, much like the owl, only it allows teachers to focus on a document that's on the table and it helps them tremendously with distance learning. Then the office and wireless upgrades will continue to keep the, like the central office got an upgrade this year. We'll have to make sure that all of the other offices are up to snuff. You know, when we focus on instruction, you know, sometimes we don't keep up with the walk, the offices, but I mean, it's critical that we keep all of those people up to date as well. The Apple TVs and the Chromecast, those allow us to do a different type of screen sharing, you know, so that you end up with the ability to cast either a Chromebook or a MacBook. We want to make sure that it's, you know, depending on what device the student or the teacher has, that anything will connect to those projectors. And under the network server and the UPS upgrades, in the shaded column, you'll see I put $30,000 in there. That's the same 30,000 that you'll see in my regular budget for E-rate, because anytime we do a network update, whether it's a server or wireless or AP, you know, the access points in the rooms, we're going to fund it with E-rate. So it's like one in the same. It's, we're not gonna just go and buy $30,000 worth of servers. We're gonna do it under E-rate so we can get $100,000 worth of servers for 30,000. So that's why that fits better in that line. Then. And then the last one was the copiers. And I spoke to Cheryl about this one because we always have copiers that need to be upgraded. What happens is DEU, who we have the master contract with DEU, they will send me a list. They'll say, Joan, all of these, these are all of your copiers. And notice the ones in red. We're going to drop those off because they've reached the 2 million page count and we're not going to service them anymore. So at that point, we have to think about, okay, do we swap things around and get those out of the building and put something else in that's used or do we buy something new? So what we're going to try this year, the, the 26 four will represent at least three copiers for the new consolidated elementary school. And after that, we will have enough money in my capital plan to buy at least two replacements because they average about 80, 85 to 8,600 a piece. So we would constantly have a, at least a couple in the district somewhere that will fall off that maintenance contract because they're too old. And it costs a lot more to have them come out and work on a machine that's no longer under contract. So that's why we try not to let that happen. We shuffle as much as we can and put the older ones in places where they don't get used as much. But 
at some point we'll have to replace a couple and an average of two a year. Reasonable. Joan, do you want to talk about how what the DOE's plan was? Remember, they didn't have a plan last year, but recently they have released information. Well, that's on the next screen. If you go to the next slide. So that was just segueing to the next slide. Yes. yes. <laughs> Excellent. So in our conversation, you know, when we talked about needing one grade level of equipment out of the local budget, that means I'll buy, you know, what I have in the, the budget, the local budget request is grade three. I think it says grade nine, but it's really for grade three. In grades seven and eight, since we're still under the five, we're still using that five-year-old equipment. And I told you that MLTI has a plan so that they're supposed to be providing us with something in the fall of 21. This is their plan. And it's going to be hard to see on the screen, but it's a plan that's quite different from what they've done before. It used to be they gave us two grade levels of computers and said, there you go. We'll see you in four years and give you something else in you know, four years from now. Well, now they've redesigned the plan so that in the fall of 21, they propose anyway, and this is all pending that it passes, you know, that the budget passes in Augusta. So it could all fall apart if the budget doesn't pass or they cut it out for some reason. So in the fall of 21, they're still saying they'll replace two grade levels, grades seven and eight. And they've always liked to tell us what grade level equipment is. You know, they, We've asked in the past, why, why seven and eight? Well, that was kind of the legacy. You know, it started out that way and they're kind of stuck with it. So in the fall of 21, they will give us two grade levels. We don't know what the equipment will be yet. There's an RFP out, in, you know, out now that was released, I think about two weeks ago, that is asking vendors to submit bids on what they would give, you know, what device they would provide for this amount of money. So that we don't know any of that yet. Then in year two, so that's a good thing, you know, that's kind of like what they've always done, that gives us two grade levels. Then in year two, which is 22, 23, they're saying they're going to have enough funding to do it again and give us two more grade levels of equipment. And then yet again in year three, which is 23, 24, they're still going to have funding there. So they're saying they can provide us with one more grade level. And again, in year four, they'll do it again, one more set. So for us, that means you can average that at about 250 per grade. So in the fall of 21, they'd be giving us like 500 of those. The fall of 22, same thing, they'll have two more grades. So for us, it would be 500 more. Then it goes down to 250 and 250 for years three, four, and five. You know, so they've done some magic in Augusta that they never, you know, I don't know, we've never looked at the budget, how they propose doing the, the well, funding. This, this is statewide that they're proposing is, to do this? That seems like a huge expense for the state. state. And they're saying they can provide 31,000 devices, you know, in year one and 62,000 in year two and 76,000 in year three, you know, so you see across the bottom of that in the bold print. <clears throat> so they have in their minds somehow a, a price. They haven't shared that with us, mm -hmm. but they must have said, okay, we figure we can get a device for $300. And so you take that 31,000 devices times 300, and that's apparently what they have in the budget. They are backing away from providing us with any kind of network. They used to give us a wireless network. So in the, we had one in Carl J. Lamb because of momentum. We had the junior high was always MLTI. And we even had some in the old high school because they provided us with a network one year. They just decided, you know, if you want to upgrade your wireless network, we'll do it for you. And we took them up on it. So now, they have stepped away from that. They're not doing any networking at all. And they're saying, we'll put all of our money into the hardware. You as a school are responsible for connectivity, you know, networking and support. 
And we don't know yet either how much professional development they're going to include, but they used to do a lot of professional development. They had a whole team of people and you could call them and say, gee, we'd like to have you come in and teach us how to do. We did iBooks. We did a lot of training on iBooks. Of course, now we don't use it because we don't have iBooks on a Chromebook, but they provided a lot of training back when the program was new. So now they've poured all of their money into the hardware piece. And it's there's still going to be a buyout in year five, which you would have seen on my five-year plan. There was a line there that said buyout, and that's why. They will give us an opportunity to buy back what equipment we had for those five years. Now, if it's a Chromebook, the odds are good that we won't buy it. And that number will go away you know, from my capital plan. But if it turns out to be a MacBook or something that has good longevity, we would probably buy it back. So, so if this plan does pass and go in, at some point, does it generate a savings in that capital long-term plan that you have? Because you wouldn't have to well, be replacing a year, uh, a grade level year, right? That's why I thought this would help you see that picture better. Because it does to some extent, but it keeps us still needing to put in one grade level per year, even though MLTI is in there. Okay. You know, doing their part, and they've, you know, we've done as much as we can with COVID. We still have, you know, the need for one local. Okay, so that's already factored into that one grade level. And that's always, yeah. that's in my five year plan. You know, that budget <clears throat> includes 250 devices each year in the local budget. Yeah, because I guess over five years, which is kind of what you're expecting, the life, the life expectancy to be with the laptops or yes. Chromebooks. Yeah. You're only getting what seven grades worth, right? Yeah. yeah, and if you look at this chart, you know, the one as you go to the next screen, it's going to be really hard for people to see that probably on their screen. But if you look, my current budget is on the screen, it's the brownish color, right? I think oh, yeah. I can see yeah. it. Okay. I think it's a rust. Yes. I think it's a rust. No, no, it's the green. <laughs> the 21, 22. Oh. And on the paper, it looks more yellow because mm -hmm. we're running out of color. But if you notice, I have grade three in there as a local purchase, even though this, you know, MLTI is down there for grades seven and eight, they're going to be providing two grades. We're going to purchase one and we'll get through 21, 22. Okay. Then in 22, 23, which is more of a pink on your screen, you'll see that we're maintaining most everything. And then in grade six, we'll get an upgrade in grade six because their equipment at that point will be three years old. The typical rotation for districts around us has always been every three years they upgrade their hardware. We have never had that luxury. We have always made ours go to the very end. And so this would be one time that in addition to COVID and MLTI combined, we could actually make you know, upgrades in a more timely fashion so that we're not spending, like this year, we're spending a lot of money on the devices that the seniors still have. And there's a few in the hands of all well, those third, fourth and fifth graders. We've had to purchase batteries because you know a battery doesn't last five years on a laptop. We've had hinges that fail, and those are not inexpensive. We do the work ourselves, but the cost of a set of hinges, you wouldn't think it would be that much, but it's $45 for a set of hinges because they're convertibles, they turn into a tablet. Actually, my daughter's broke, and I thought she did something wrong, so <laughs> no, I'll pay you the 40 bucks. Yes. <laughs> no, it was not. I'll take it now. Yeah, yeah. I'll add it. You're yeah. doing cash on the way right. out. Well. <laughs> it was not her fault. We've had a lot of, with that particular model, had a lot of injuries. So you'll see that we will be purchasing one grade level or replacing, like if you go to, the 22-23, we're maintaining everything, we're upgrading grade six, but we should be replacing the devices in grade 10 by then. So that we don't hit that cliff or that 
bubble doesn't emerge, you know, and get us because we've purchased so much at one time. That as long as we spread it out, we can maintain and keep our equipment in good working order, you know, with just one grade level purchase each year. And then we have to wait and see what happens to MLTI in five years from now, whether they can fund, you know, a continuation of the program. There's always that risk. It seems like we hear it every year that the MLTI may just go away. You're all going to be on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, so we put that chisel in stone with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, Joan, um, you might have mentioned this, but the other part is uh, in the past or years ago, they would, they, the uh, Department of Education would determine what device you got. Now it looks like they're going to provide maybe five or six options that we'd be able to choose from because we're going to get an allocation of money. And some of those may be devices that would require more of a local contribution and some others might even provide some savings. Do I have that accurate? Well, they are going to offer us six choices and that is new because like I said earlier, it used to be that it seemed like we always got an Apple device. Then when the page came in, he said, no, no, you need more choices. So we got a choice of an Apple device or a <laughs> you know, so it wasn't a huge choice, but now they're up to six choices, and they call it a menu of either an iOS device, which would be an iPad, a Mac OS, which would be a laptop, a Windows device, or a Chrome, and then they have a category called other, which we're not really sure, but there's something that somebody has brought up that didn't fit in any of those other categories. So that would be a menu, so to speak, of what we can tell them we want. But their objective is still to use volume buying power. You know, so that's why they're not going to let us go willy nilly to any vendor. They're going to say, well, if you want a Chromebook, it's going to be this vendor, you know, which already some people are not happy with because, like, what we've done, we've established a rapport with a particular vendor. You can work a better deal sometimes because they know you're going to keep coming back and purchasing from them or their support is better. We wouldn't have that luxury. We would have to purchase the Chromebook from the vendor that they have accepted the RFP on. So that's the only drawback to that, but it is nice that they're offering choices. And they're saying that they hope that the price, you know, that will be better than what we can do on our own, which most logically it would be. And, you know, that that's a big difference. So yes. But as far as them just giving us money, that's not been discussed. We're going to, I have a meeting tomorrow, and that's one question that we have, because why not just give us the funds instead of, and the answer to that is they lose buying power. They want volume you know, to get the best price. So if they say to Sanford, oh, you don't want to participate? Here, just take your money, go do what you want. They've lost the ability to negotiate for 500 more devices. Yeah, I'm sure that impacts the smaller school districts more than over here. Like, we're large enough that we can probably get a decent deal. Right. But you go up to, you know, Prescott, like Fort Kent or middle of nowhere. Right. They, don't, they only need 50. Yeah. They're not going to get the deal mm -hmm. unless they partner with another. It makes sense. I'm actually kind of surprised we're getting the six options because that makes it even harder to negotiate. You really need to standardize at some point. We're yeah. trying to, although it's always evolving, so it's hard to do that. Right. Even right. each brand has different generations. So. And I, I think that they've you know, seen a pattern of what we've used over the years, and they're kind of pounding on that continuum. But, you know, that's a good question. Like, but just a handful of people wanted Windows because when they had the opportunity to buy Windows machines from HP five years ago, there were very few schools that went with Windows. So I have a question, funding question. Hey, Matt, the, I don't know if it's a contingency fund. I don't want to think of that. You have one for energy, I think. Can there be one for IT? Uh, I'm not asking an accurate question, I know. So Jonathan's talking about the reserve funds. Right. We have 
Um, I, I don't think we have one for technology, but it might make sense that we might want to look at one that would probably have to go through the process similar to what we did before and put it on this, this spring's referendum. But that, you know, that's probably something we may want to look at, or we can look and see if the ones we have existing, we could kind of, if they do qualify, I'm not sure, but it, I think that's probably something to look into and make sense, especially in some of these areas where we're getting some things front loaded. I actually uh, have that on my to-do list also. So look into that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> slow to the left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll blame it on She did that for effect. <laughs> Joan, you're ready to go to the next slide, or are you still here? No, we can zip through the rest of that chart, and I guess if people that are not in the building want a copy of that, I'd be happy to send them, you know, a paper or an electronic copy. But if, yeah, if you go to that last page that says other items. Right here. This is my... My last comment is that we, I don't ever discuss salary and benefits. So, I mean, that's always Cheryl and Matt that will cover that part of the budget anyway. But I did just like to point out that as we handed out 500 new devices to the staff, very few of them turned in their old device. <laughs> because as you can see, there's a real advantage to remote learning and teaching if you have two devices. So many of them are still in the classroom. They have one book to their owl, and then they're able to take attendance. They're able to, you know, do other things on their other laptop, you know, that they intend to carry out in the class. So we never, we didn't in, expect too many to turn them in, and we didn't ask them to, for that very reason. Did, we, that, did we lose many, I don't mean that in a negative sense, but when they went home last school year and we wrote front return of retrieval day, did we some just never resurface? Mm -hmm. A few. Yeah. Not not too too many, because the ones that didn't get turned in then became you know active again when school started. Okay. So it means that the student just didn't bother to bring it yep. when we asked them to. They kept it. They turned it back on and we could verify that that was that student using it. Okay. Now in the fall or in the summer, when we if if we collect whatever we do, right. I, I have no idea what that what that might look like. Yeah, right. Um we've only had a couple, we've had eight um issues with the iPads in K2, where six of them have had broken screens, which really surprised me. We put a nice case on them expected them to be you know in pretty good shape but i was surprised that so far and we only handed them out right before christmas that you know already we've had six broken ones so mm -hmm. that's a little disappointing because that's a lot you know that's not an inexpensive repair for a screen and then um we've had a couple get lost but the chromebooks themselves were doing quite well you know as far as keeping tabs on them because we can look them up we can see what IP they're on, we see who the user is that was using it last. You know, so we have a good way to, to monitor that. And the two that are lost, we've, we've got the same ability on the iPads to be able to ping them, see where they are, just like on your phones, find yeah. my iPhone. But if they're not on, if the battery went dead, or if they're not on a network, obviously you're never going to find it. So. So that's why on the chart or on the page now you see 650 instructional staff devices because many of them, many of the staff have two, and we did even give them some older iPads, you know, that helped with their instruction, especially in science or math, where they wanted to do demonstrations and they needed extra cameras. And you know, those ed techs that all received a new device, that was it's actually a benefit. Obviously, we're not taking care of old equipment. We have over 600 projectors, teaching walls, and owls that we help teachers with. So the 3,000, you add the 3,000 student devices to that, along with the office equipment, you can see that we're supporting a lot of equipment. And mm -hmm. there's three in techs, because we've never been able to increase you know, that 
10, even though we have more than three buildings to cover. So the three ed techs cover Willard, hmm. Carl J. Lamb, Margaret Chase, and the middle school now. So there's two people, you know, for those four locations. And then the tech lead, who also is, is Tim Brownell, that you probably know the name, but he's here almost exclusively because he's not only doing tech support in the building with Scott, he's also taking care of the network. You know, so there's something, you know, not necessarily physically for the network, but any server that needs attention or updates or something. So our, our ratio, you know, is what I was trying to point out, isn't anything to brag about. <laughs> Actually, so, I think it is something to brag well, about, the fact yeah, that you get it done yeah, without a few say, people. I will brag about how much, <laughs> you know, I feel like the whole team has stepped up we answer the phone, we get emails from parents. So in addition to 3,000 students, quite often we're supporting the parents of those students. And so we're, we're keeping up. And, you know, I have to give credit to everybody that, you know, put, you know, pitches in to all of that. Secretaries is, you know, the secretaries are doing a great job. They'll even field those phone calls sometimes and say, well, your child's login should be, and you know, and they'll give them a few tips, and you know, so everybody has a good okay. So, John, with that, um, I gotta assume you'd like to have at least one tech in every building, on top of the the lead, and then yourself, right? Right. Do you think you need more than that, or is that would that be like bare bones? And then if you can have more, be better. You no, know, I think if we had one more person, you know, because we have. You know, Margaret Chase is a bit of a drive away from everything else. We could easily share a person between the two closest buildings, you know, like the middle school and the new elementary school. You know, that's easier to, to say we can share a person there and then have somebody at Carl Bay Lamb and somebody at Margaret Chase. But we have to see how it kind of works out, where the demand is. You know, it's kind of the determining factor on where we place another person. But yes, it'd be awesome to have one more Okay. Well, let's come my next question. Is there more of a demand at the elementary level or the high school level? Or is it kind of depending? Yeah, I would, it's, well, we've had such great um, staff training, you know, the staff that gets it, you know, the staff that has a, has a good strategy, they step up and they help each other tremendously. Um, so I would say it's pretty equal, you know, across district i wouldn't say any one building is any, any more needy than or even any grade level because you've got those key people among your team or your level that tend to step up and really so, so you've got a tech savvy teacher who's actually helping the other teachers right. so at that. this point those three ed techs are just roaming throughout the district well not they don't roam any more than they absolutely have to do. Okay. But um so Craig will stay at the middle school unless I need him to go someplace else. Okay. So know, they do kind of have a home. Yes. Place. Okay. Yeah. So but, John, as I <clears throat> talk in some of these meetings about student services as well as more virtual learning, <clears throat> was that let me just stay on virtual learning for a second. What, what does that say to you? If I'm saying we you know, Matt. We need more virtual learning. I don't really know what the heck I'm saying, but uh, well, I, I use the example of some of the AP classes where kids could be sharing a service with a noble teacher. Um, what technology do we need to that? Before that, does that make you nervous? Is it, we need more devices, we need more capacity of some sort. Yeah, well, it doesn't make me at all nervous because we were awarded the Rust Grant and I think you've heard me mention that before, and we just now got that equipment ordered. So what that's going to provide to us is a Zoom room. So if we came up with one of those programs or some content where the teacher was teaching to two or three other locations, that Zoom room becomes the perfect environment because it has the latest and greatest technology for cameras, remote control, it has the best audio, you know, that when that equipment comes in, you will be very impressed at how efficient a person could be teaching in that. You wouldn't be plugging in an owl and having a dedicated laptop. Everything is. Yeah, so is that similar like, um, we actually for FedEx sort of work for, 
in the headquarters, they have some rooms and stuff like that for conferencing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, it, it's, I'm assuming it's the same kind of setup where it's all, the room's all mic, there's different cameras, you've got like laptop sharing, so it's like dot toggles where you can just hook in and mm -hmm. jump around to different laptops to present. Like that kind of deal. Does that well, that's phenomenal. Does does that give this uh, our school department an advantage, or other schools doing similar things? Well, in order to apply for the West grant, which is the Rural Utility Services and the USDA, you have to partner with other districts. So they won't just help Sanford. They want to know that you're spreading the wealth. They well, that's what I was going to ask. That's question. the plan. Right. Yeah. So other districts also have a. Uh, that capability in this immediate area? Well, it, it, it was our partners, so they're yeah. not terribly immediate, but we did partner with Bon Eagle, so they're okay. a partner. Mm -hmm. We do have a partnership with the Indian Township because they're uh, what you need to do when you do the Rust Grant, you need to find partners that have needs that you mm -hmm. can assist with. So we might be able to offer our AP class to the Indian Township schools, you know, maybe they haven't had an AP class in a certain content area and they would like one. So we could have, you know, that partnership extend to teaching that class, just like we did when we had the ATM room. Do you remember? <coughs> Back to the, this, the old high school, second floor, yeah. and we had all the TVs and everything. That was what we did in that room. It was a concept was the same, only that was funded by the state. And under the Rust Grant, you just have to write a proposal. So our other partners include schools in Montana, and and that's a wonderful thing because these are that's handy. It's <laughs> it's what handy. handy. I, know. I, know. I, just, I think that's interesting though because technology it doesn't have to be noble. It doesn't have to be massive. Yeah, right. If it's somebody, if it was somebody in like Europe or so, that would be phenomenal to be able to have these classes. But how does it help us with the budget? I don't care about that. Well, I just think the technology is cool. the point of the meeting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we're talking about the budget. Yeah. Money. Money. You're I'm not, look at Amy's face mask. You'll never, ask, you'll never see me requesting any of that in our local budget because it's all been paid for. And we'll end up with two rooms at the high school, two rooms at the junior high, and two rooms at the adult ed building. So it helps us greatly even within our own district. Exactly. Okay. So that equipment is paid for basically by the grant. <clears throat> then if you can extend that, you know, value by offering a course to the Indian Township, um, I'm trying to think of the other one that's um, the technical school. Um, yeah. yeah, that was always a challenge. The other, you know, how to compensate a teacher who's teaching a remote class for somebody, you know, in Montana and what to do for scheduling because the bell schedule was always the biggest challenge for the atm project you know it was wonderful that we could teach latin to the school in bucksport but there we were on a four day and they were on a, uh, some other kind of schedule so there was always that work around schedules and bells you know their first block started 10 but, minutes before but, hours or, but what if it were um they could watch it later. Yep, and that's the beauty of having the equipment that we're getting. We'll have that capability of recording. So you said something a minute ago that what makes me want to ask another question. You said no, 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 no that doesn't bother me. What does bother me? <laughs> what, 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 what gives you the most angst for, the, for your responsibilities for this? All things IT. Um, is it when Jonathan asks you questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'll jump in because uh, Joan's a rock star, but I would also say that Joan has also been integral with the construction projects because of just the technology setup and going in there. I think that probably causes a lot of angst in terms of just added things uh, there that we're trying to be able to, because remember those plans were made years ago and technology changes so fast. So Joan's been uh, awesome at trying to be able to anticipate that and stay within the vision of our plan by trying to have equity amongst all the different schools. And so I know that's, uh, those are some changes and things that have to happen. So I think um, Joan, I, I think I know I can speak for you to say that does cause a lot of angst in terms of just all the work that that requires. 
Yeah, knock on wood. That's but it's been like forever. It seems like it's been forever. Yep, yeah. I know. It's but it's still, still the school committee. But it really has been. Even been. once the elementary school's done, though, you still have like probably a year of troubleshooting afterwards to kind of get yes. in there and find out what you're really dealing with. Right. Yeah. I mean, just the follow up to just this building alone seems like it just never got done, but then it eventually gets done. Yeah. So I have a, a kind of an out of the box question with that room we're talking about with the multimedia Zoom room Zoom. off the grant. <laughs> is that restricted to just educational uses or after hours? Could we potentially have a revenue stream and rent it out if you would to businesses that want to use it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you think if you had a small business that wanted to interact with someone, they needed the space to do it. Or needed professional development time, you know, professional just development. Yeah. Just a short term. I, you know, that would be a question I'd have to ask Pat and Cheryl. No, I just didn't know if the grant was restricted with that. No. Okay. It doesn't so from the grant, we just had, we had these partner schools, so we just need to kind of collaborate with them and use it to enhance. So if we, even if we don't, if if we, we don't, can use it ourselves for students to work, take Latin night. Mm -hmm. Adult ed, I'm sure. Yeah, we can go on a line of that. Yeah. So you're right. Okay, I got it. It's just yeah. interesting to hear about an asset like that coming in. I mean, mm -hmm. And again, another really, really solid asset for the, the school department. Yeah, so. and if, if you remember the Tanford, you remember those? I remember the word. There, and there used to be one sitting here. It's now in the conference room of the, you know, right over there in Fort Madison. And it, that was purchased all with um, USDA funds. That was like a earlier version of what we're doing, but now it's just so much better. We're going to have all polycom cameras and audio system, and you know it will be much like what you're familiar with. Will that be for next September? Um, we've ordered the equipment, so it depends it's on. on the, is that on the boat too? No, no, actually, Promethean. It's because on the boat. <laughs> one of the you know, part of it will be Promethean equipment, and that's very available. For some reason, there's no. You know, supply chain issue with oh. so I would anticipate we could get it in nothing like during the summer. Is the screen is the is the screen like the size of that TV? Or are we talking massive? It would be a seventy-five inch. Yeah, yeah, a little bit bigger than that. Hmm. And one will be mounted on the wall like that, mm -hmm. and the other will be on a cart. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of having it on a cart is that you're not limited to being in a physical space. You know, if this room was busy, you wheel it out to another room and everything would be, you know, ready to go. It's not, you know, we're not going to mic the ceiling. It has surround sound okay. amplification and, you know, it will handle being moved around. Wow. Oh, cool. Which I understood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get a demo for you. Yeah, right. You just know it's cool. I, you know, I saw the big one. <laughs> John said it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> Uh, I have no more questions. <laughs> um, hey, Matt, in the uh, the list of budget wants, was the extra tech person in there, I think, or no? Yes. And so, <laughs> and so I, I want to, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Don, because one thing that we did add into the budget was we did add in uh, extra work time for the current ed techs. Because with all of that technology we have, there is more time that we need them um, before school begins and after school ends. Correct, Joan? And Cheryl took care of that. Okay. You know, like, okay. So just that, just additional hours built in. Yeah. That's all we have for the ex for the existing. As Joan mentioned, really there is a need there, uh, probably for another additional ed tech, just so that they can be able to be um provide better service to all the all of our schools and more outreach and and i think and i'm sure all if you can clarify i had asked if we could put in a tech integrator into the next round of covid funds because Cheryl has said they find that round as you know like lost learning sure. catching up on lost learning and i think one thing that we would benefit greatly from is to bring that position back it was purchased, it was funded before by a block grant and then the grant ended and we didn't refill it. So if we had that tech integrator person, they would also be some tech support because obviously they're going to have the knowledge of troubleshooting hardware as well as, you know, 
figuring out lessons and working with teachers, but it's those people that struggled with the distance learning and ways to manipulate all the equipment that they, we really could have used a person in that role. Hey, Matt, would that be one of those positions that if we could get it, it would be a position that would come to an end in three years? That's yeah, I, I think that as, as we're looking at those federal funds, as Jones mentioned, yeah, that gets in with lost learning and it gets in with the technology piece. But you're right, John, that would not that would be something with funding that would eventually be going away if that was something we dedicated it to. Mm -hmm. That would be coming out at three point two million. Yeah, the yeah. federal funds. Yeah. Yeah. But then give us three years to figure out how we're going to put it in the world. And I think, you know, I, I, I agree. Everyone's fingers crossed. But, you know, listen, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of grants, but I think at this point in time, that type of use for the lost, lost, of, it, lost of education by students is important at this time, I think. So, I guess I could. But as we said the other night, I think that's the second discussion of where we're going to, because realistically, sure. 3.2 million is not a lot of money when you're talking roughly a million dollars a year. That's mm -hmm. not, for the summertime, it's good because there won't be full salaries, stipends for teachers to work the summer school, so we'll get a bigger bang. But I really think that's a great, you know, a next second discussion that we can have mm -hmm. once we get through this over the next month. Because we can't spend it, we'll find places for it, and we desperately need it. Yeah, my Thank thought would be with that as a position, if you wanted it to end up in the budget in three years, would be to maybe the first year it's fully paid by that by the COVID funds, maybe half the next year, and then the next year ends up in our budget, so that then you're fully bringing it on our budget, so it's not as big of a hit at all at once. Would be an option. Yeah. Hey, Cheryl, um, how does the EPS formula handle all the tech support stuff? Are we um, getting decent? So, so the techs, we get a flat dollar amount per student. And I, um, uh, that's one of the things I want to look at and look at it towards our costs and see what we, what percentage we get. But I haven't done that yet. Thanks. Uh, hey, Matt, we talked when we talk summer school, Matt, is there like a tech part of that cost that's going to be worked into? Or are we not anticipating that? And like the, the techs, do they work for the summer, John, or is it just well, school year? Um, I've only got two people. One is the network slash technician that's up here, and the other one is at the middle school that's funded year round. Gotcha. So those additional 10 days that Cheryl added to the other two people would help. But it's certainly not going to get us through summer school. Yeah, it's so if we're doing like full summer school, that's another aspect that needs to be. We did do that back when we ran summer school every summer at the old high school. Remember, we always set a schedule. I did have a person who was paid like a half a day every day for five days because when people came in, something just didn't work. You needed somebody in the building. You know? yeah. So, you know, that would help tremendously if there was a full summer school schedule to have. At least something dedicated to the building that it's in. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, kind of a side question that when we talked summer school years ago and had a physical summer school, was it mostly high school? Junior high? But now I think we're talking almost eight straight up. Well, at least one through 12. I don't know, okay, but, but straight up. I wonder if. Right, so would you have it all in one school still, or yeah, I don't know. I don't think we, I don't think we wrestled with that yet. That's question. So, we Matt? Hey, Matt, are you still there? Yeah, no, I'm still here. I, I, I'm listening. Um, yeah, I think summer school uh, that we were, the, the plans that we're looking at is robust. Uh, we're looking at that for all of our students at all levels, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, I did, I was writing down that uh, one thing to consider is tech support for the summer because that was something that might be uh, easily overlooked. You are right when it comes to, all right, we're gonna offer it, then it's gonna be, where are we gonna offer it? Because uh, we've also got to utilize uh, getting our schools ready for the following year and, and, and cleaned and summer cleaned. 
for that. And so that's going to be a challenge that we're going to have to be able to coordinate um, space and also facility use in terms of what we're looking at. Now, when you talk about summer school, I guess I am, um, I always think of some of the willing and able uh, upper class level students helping second, third, fourth, fifth graders. Is that possible? Uh, we, we hadn't thought about it. More like uh, big brother, big sister, mentor uh, type of thing uh, involving uh, tutors and those types of things for it. Um, I, that's something that we haven't talked about, no, but there might be something there. Obviously, I, I just worry about that because for some kids, it may work out great. For others, they may have a lot of things going on this summer in terms of um, whether or not they're working or if they're around or if their schedules just line up for that. If you look at our, you know, our upperclassmen, and I don't know the number, but I would venture to say, you're probably gonna have five to 10 students that are going into college to be teachers. Yeah. And I think that would be a great summer job where that would make them be around because that'd be a great way of Entering into where they're taking their career. It's a good idea, John. What's wrong with you? It took two of us to come up to it. I don't think we had to. We just stopped from Hey, you know, you might be able to find some summer employees would be the kids that are graduating that are going to college for education. Yeah. Maybe they would want to. Yeah. <laughs> And then the parks and rec people might cringe as you're taking all their uh, counselors. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are the kids that don't want to go to the kitchen. So that's a different pool. Oh, I don't know. I think wow. after the rec, they're like, ah! <laughs> but that's something. Yeah, I think Amy's right because that, that is the bread and butter in the heart of, the, of our um, city recreation program for the summer program. Absolutely. <laughs> Are you planning on chatting with the rec department and trying to coordinate some? Because it seems like that would be a good fit. Because a lot of the kids are in the summer camp programs with rec, you know, kind of for a place to go. So at the same time, maybe we can get an education component, you know, and help, you know, help both sides. So. Yeah, I know Beth uh, Lambert has reached out to uh, Lori in the rec department. Uh, when we meet this week with the city leadership team, that's one of the items I'd like to just bring up as well. Uh, that coordination, because as, as we've talked about previously in these workshops, we're not looking at, you know, the traditional summer school that was um, uh, really um, more of just uh, academics and driven and, and, and I want to use the word boring in terms of that. We've got to be able to come back and coordinate what we have for resources between um, breakfast and lunch with Holly Hartley's program with the transportation coordinating with the rec so that there might be some components that are academic to a person's day and then the rest of it is connected with the rec department around some more recreational activities or getting out in the water and swimming or going on some field trips I just in, as we've talked about it we envision some of that uh, being part of that because of the learning loss has hit everyone. In the past, summer school might have been people um, who were a little bit behind or who were lacking credits and really were just there to do what they needed so they could get their credit and move on. I think we've got to kind of look at uh, this through the learning, uh, the loss of learning and how we can kind of really be creative to be able to try to leverage that so that we want to have people saying, sure, summer school, yeah, as opposed to someone going, oh, geez, summer school. Uh, we've got to be able to try to uh, be creative with that. You know, Matt, I, we've seen a lot of emails coming to us, you know, recently about getting children back into school and they're all great emails. And I really think this is something we need to make sure the community knows what we are doing just to say you know, so they know what what it's going to be at this point we don't know but i think this is a message that we have to get out that we are, it's going to be a lot different and it's going to be robust this summer in next summer it's something that i, I really believe the community should be hearing about that yeah um well, i think we're, we're getting away from joan's part of this so do you have anything else joan are you good or? no i was at the end of mine if you have any questions or so questions for John, anybody? I mean, I did want to mention that in the regular budget line, 
the repair and maintenance line did not go down, even though we have new equipment because of what's happening out there. <laughs> you know, the screens are the most expensive piece if, unless it's water damage on, and we have had a few water damage already, and that takes the whole bunch of board right out of the picture. So it's a, that's a costly repair. But it's mostly the screens that kids don't tend to always tell us about because they can keep using the machine if it just has a crack, but we don't want to reissue that without fixing the screen. So I didn't reduce the repair line for that reason, because you just never know what we're going to get in when equipment comes back. And we're not charging a fee. Like we used to charge at the high school, remember, a $25 yeah. fee if you chose to take your computer home. And we're not doing that because obviously we told everybody they had to take it home. So we couldn't, you know, Right. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I didn't yeah. really think of that aspect of it. Yeah. I mean, is there? Yeah. Uh, I'll leave that up to you. Know, if if a family, if, let's just say the the mother dropped a coffee off, you know, kind of thing, and hypothetically, you know, <laughs> uh, hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically, <laughs> that did not happen. I've got friends. Or like hypothetically, you lose the charger, and like you want, you know, but is there like are families being billed? No. Should we? It's, can you collect? I, that was to me. I, and if it doesn't come, it doesn't come. But someday. It almost seems to me it's like a like a you know three strikes kind of thing. Like hey, the first one happens, it happens, whatever. But if it's like a repeat customer that just keeps breaking stuff and losing stuff. But I don't know if we really have a policy. But for actually, that. Joe, go down because I know we've had this discussion before, and it slipped my mind. But why don't you talk? What did we used to do? Because I remember this conversation. Yeah, right. we get, 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 get a lot of cash. What do we do with textbooks? Right, same thing. That's right. You know, same thing. They would get a bill for textbooks if it wasn't returned, if it was damaged right. to the extent that it can't be used. So what we did, rather than buy into one of these insurance companies that were trying really hard for the longest time to say, here, buy a policy pay us all this money and then we'll fix whatever to a point you know and then your premium is basically gone and if you didn't use up everything that you know the value of what you paid in that premium then you lost that money so we said we'll just do ourselves you know we'll do kind of like a self-insurance and just charge a 25 dollar fee and take it out of the building only at the high school we did it one year at the junior high then we decided not to send them home again at the junior high but so if the student paid the $25 to take it home and then mom spilled the coffee on it, the minimum was a $50 charge, even though it might have been a $200 repair because the whole water board is gone. But because we had that pot of money from $25, you know, from everybody, they were kind of helping each other by contributing that $25, you know, kind of like yeah. premium. I guess, and then we called it a fifty dollars deductible or something really serious. You know, how like ten years now you're talking premiums and deductibles. Yeah, it's like right locked on. Yeah, <laughs> he's seeing something. He's seeing it. <laughs> so, so I would encourage you to work with you on on kind of a contingency plan or savings or savings account as well. Okay. So maintenance be one, but other stuff too. So, Joan, so, how about? What are we looking at for damage in terms of with all the widespread use of these devices? Uh, can you give it an idea of, of um, an overview of what we've been looking at for damage? I didn't bring those numbers with me now because it wasn't a number that I had in the, the budget specifically, but I do know like it was $1,500 for those eight iPads. Oh. No, total for the eight. To get those eights back up in good condition, it was $1,500 for those. Each charger that a student loses, and that seems to be the issue right now, is lost chargers. Those, mm -hmm. those, there's, there's somebody's car or backpack. Yeah. Yeah. They're like $50 for, an, for the CTLs, the older Chromebooks. The Max are you know, $60, and you can buy a, a USB-C version, you know, for like $35 on Amazon or something. Um, you know, so that seems to be the most expensive issue right now is the missing or lost chargers. We did have to go through a lot of batteries for those older Chromebooks. Um, I don't know, those were like $50 a piece, I think, for a battery. But they did hold up for a long time, I have to say. 
that did last four years before we had a rash of replacements. But this year, we had 100% of the devices up on the buildings. Right. With last year, we didn't right. well until the second half of the year. We had always carried about 200. In this high school, we always had carts with about 200 in them that people chose not to take them home because they had something else or they yeah. just didn't feel comfortable doing it. You know, so that was that was a little revenue, basically. It wasn't really revenue, but it was enough to keep us in chargers and batteries without mm -hmm. dipping into local funds. But yeah, now Joe, we don't have that. Joan, one of the things um, I know last year when we did go full remote and we issued out our devices, um, you and I had that conversation, you know, we were both very worried of what was going to happen in terms of damage to the devices, lost devices, lost equipment. Is it safe to say um, we've done better than maybe we initially feared or is that not accurate? I think we've done a little bit better than what we anticipated could have happened. And so just in the, without taking, you know, a look at my actual inventory, we did have 26 Chromebooks not returned out of the high school. Now that doesn't mean that some of those 26 didn't get turned back on in September and the students had them, you know, like I said earlier. Um, we had one iPad not returned at the middle school because last year the fifth grade had iPads, so we only had one that didn't come back. We had three laptops at the middle school and those at the time were the Macs, so that's a little bit more of an expense. You know, if you tried to replace that Mac, it's going to cost you $8.99 as opposed to a $3.99 Chromebook. So, you know, that cost was a little bit higher for the middle school. But it's mostly batteries and chargers that have cost us. But really, I didn't feel bad at all about right. high school. I didn't, you know, I thought we did very, very well. Yeah, that you know, was that that's kind of where I was going with that. That you know, there's things that keep us up at night, but that wasn't one of them, at least for me. Maybe it should be, but I don't think that was something that we were looking at uh, with it. Now, I think we still want to be wise to be able to work to see if there's some things we can develop. Uh, with that, but all in all, I think we've done a pretty decent job, all things considered. I agree. I mean, it's more, it's more the damage this year, you know, like we've had a lot of, I don't have the number with me for what we've spent to repair the Apple laptops, you know, they're five years old and you kind of, you kind of think, should I or shouldn't I, but then we didn't have any, you know, we didn't have enough inventory to replace the student device if we didn't fix it. So we had to fix it, you know, just because we had no other ones to give them. So it was, you know, it was a little more expensive this year at the at the middle school for the max when they got damaged. It doesn't, it's not bad enough that I would say it should keep anybody up at night. That's good. But I'll, I mean, I'll talk to Cheryl about what we could do for that little fund, you know, that instead of charging the family, a fee you're suggesting that it has come out of you know the, the budget and say we'll set aside x number of dollars that yeah even if you said some percentage of your budget so one and a half percent that's just an example that want to go into kind of rainy day fund for you to be able to say i need 40 new batteries i need but you, you don't it's hard to budget some of the stuff it's still going to be doing it's talking about the food environment technology it's only going to get more expensive and I, I actually don't see it an issue if you have to replace somebody's battery, you sending home with a student, you know, a bit essentially. And if you get it, you get it. But if you don't, you don't. But if you do, it's more money to replace other batteries that go missing. That's right. You know, it's kind of like the library books when you some are going to pay and some are not. Like right. some of the schools will never see the missing book. You know, but they still send the bills. But well, they still send the bill with Carl Landwood. If I if I forgot a book, because I always find it six months later, but exactly. I pay the bill. <laughs> but you know, I don't see. I, I agree, and there are those who can afford to pay those. Accounts right, and, and if, if you, you don't get it, that. you don't get it. There's no harm done, but yeah. there's also no harm done asking someone to replace what they lost. Yeah. yeah. Well, that might also yeah. like say it's a charger they can't find. It is like in the backseat of the car, but they just get another one from school. They're not going to bother trying to find it. But if they get a bill right. for a new one, that well, gives them $60 of an initiative to go yeah. and try to find it. I have a thought. I don't know. 
I'm just gonna go grab it from your guy next year. Okay, I lost my charger, so I'm just gonna borrow my friends and maybe I never yeah. get it back to them. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, anything else for Joan? No, right. No, always a pleasure, Thank you, John. Thank you, John. You're working hard. Thank you. Thank you. Well organized. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for, us, thanks for keeping us plugged in. Yeah. Good. Good one. Good one. John's going to be able to drop some new turns. John's going to go to his tech guy at work tomorrow and like, drop some new turns. And... No. It's uh, okay, Matt, what do you have for us for a review of overall school budget? Okay, so as I mentioned last um, on Monday, uh, the last time that we left, we were at approximately a 5.2% increase. And so we have um, made some uh, changes or recommendations rather. We haven't done it yet, but uh, we do have a couple uh, staffing and changes in position. And uh, those happen at the high school where there's a science teacher position that we're not going to fill. And then there's also a, um, what will uh, equate to one uh, full teaching position. We're gonna change that um, phys ed position into a half phys ed, half social studies. And so that will allow us to also save another position. So when you look at that, the total savings um, at those points um, will come back to be about $179,000. But then we also, following a conversation in a previous workshop, uh, recommending that we add in a new art teacher at the middle school. Um, and this was something that we had uh, when we were talking about um, both the um, high school uh, classes and the scheduling, as well as uh, the arts. This will allow, um, be a big help at the uh, Sanford Middle School for the Allied Arts by having that art teacher, but it'll also have a impact here at the high school that will allow um, our middle school students to get more uh, preparation in art that would allow them to also not have that prerequisite or that bottleneck at the fundamentals of art that is um, really the holding people up and other students from taking some of the other art classes for electives. So we looked at that as you know, we're really getting a lot of, um, for that one position, it's really being impactful in a lot of different ways. And so that would add back into the budget uh, just under $74,000. And so what we're looking at for a change there is about $105,460. And so that will move our 5.2% increase down to 4.5%. And so right now that increase would be 700, just over $700,000. Remember uh, our debt on the bond for the elementary and middle school construction uh, that comes on the books this year for both principal and interest is $430,000. And so um, that comes out roughly to about uh, 2.7. Uh, percent of that increase is going to be the bond. So that's some of the work that we have done based on some of the previous conversations. Cheryl, I think also we we're able to find some uh, small savings also in uh, when we got our subsidy for uh, community adult education and by also taking off one of the lease payments at the bridge, correct? Yeah, so what I found um, when we got the um, allocation for adult ed, it actually added um, $2,955 into our revenue. Um, and I also um, found that we actually have a leased um, vehicle at the bridge that we are going to turn back in because we bought two buses with the COVID money that we're going to put one of those, the smaller bus out of the two and put it down at bridge. 
so that um, we don't have that lease payment anymore, which is going to be a savings of $4,896 a year. So Matt, basically what you're saying, the operating budget is increasing 1.8% excluding the bond. Where we are right now, if we it, it by take if we do decide to take the changes that I've just recommended around that science position and uh, the phys ed position at the high school, and then moving uh, phys ed uh, social studies combo position, and then also adding the art back at the middle school, yes, that gets us to about a one point eight percent increase um, when you don't take the the bond. With the bond, yeah, now it gets out at 4.5 percent. That's I mean, from an operation standpoint. So, you know, you know, I was going to say, from an operation standpoint, that's you know, that's close to flat. Obviously, it's 1.8, so it's not flat. But we do have the bond in there. Yeah, and don't be fooled by the, the bond. The bond is quick money we would have done over a long period of time in the CIP. So, don't don't get fooled that we're at 1.8. So some of the that yeah, but we give you five, ten million to exactly. go get some stuff. You borrow right. the money, you got to pay. That's right. right. So, so that's part of it. Now, so uh, say, how, does, um, how does everybody feel about the, about the proposed that Matt just said as far as the high school positions and then moving our teacher to the middle school? Does that sound yeah. good? No, I like it. Yeah. That sounds like everybody likes that, Matt. So. Well, I want to I want to be clear. We're not moving a our teacher. We're adding one. We're going to add a teacher, so it's going to the middle school budget, but it's going to help there, but it also is going to also help at the high school. So it's just with that, but I, I just want to be clear that it's not an existing position. We're trading out two positions and putting one back in. Well, the, the, the civil, sorry, go ahead, Amy. No, 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 I was going to get my phone. This, your email earlier triggered something. Hi, triggered? <laughs> yeah. My, uh, my thinking on this, it's the first time in a long time I've heard us add something to the arts so I support that in general anyway. Mm -hmm. I think it's great that it it um impacts two different issues that we have. Right. I think that's all. So so that's good. Um yeah so I think I kind of agree with what Jonathan was saying. I, I think we'll fool ourselves when we start talking like it's only a 1.8 percent increase. Yeah. It still really is a four and a half. And when it goes to the budget committee, that's how they're going with that. Yeah. So the bond helped us get to one point eight. Would be the other thing. And if I, had, uh, Cheryl, you can probably help with this. But for every hundred thousand dollars, that's a 06 percent decrease. Yes. Yep. So if you were to look at it to say we're going to bring that one point eight percent down to where the bond was at two point seven percent. We're still looking at three hundred thousand dollars to be able to come to two point seven percent. Now, some of the things um, out there that uh, we things we have to consider, uh, and I'm not um, recommending. Um, I'm just um, I'm sharing the information. In that, what we have is, if you remember, we had special education talk Monday night. And so one of the things that um, could happen is if we were to move the bridge program over to um, uh, Lafayette School, for example, that would allow us to save about $40,000 um, for that. And so, and then we also, uh, the, the idea about starting a bridge program for younger students, not just grades eight through 12. And where we are with that, as far as um, is that going to be savings? Is that going to be a cost? Is that going to be neutral? Uh, but we do know that that will save us $40,000 in terms of just moving the location of what we have right now um, for that. The other thing that had been put out there before originally at the beginning was uh, from athletics, remember we have the first team uh, programs. And so when you're looking at all in, in traditionally, those are our freshman programs. Um, they have been out of the budget before during tight times, but we did be able to bring them back into the budget 
it's not freshman programs for every athletic program. It would be freshman programs for the ones that tend to be more popular and so uh, with interest. And so when you have that, you know, we're now talking about another idea of $60,000 in savings there. So that's before we get to any, um, because as we talked about, the majority of our budget is salary and benefits. And so when you're starting to make meaningful um, um, cuts or meaningful uh, progress with that, it often comes down to positions. The other thing that's not in this budget as well, we've talked some of it about our federal funding and looking at that through the lens of lost learning in summer school and maybe some of the tech help and those things. We also have, there's no carryover in this budget as revenue. Uh, we used to have um, carryover in revenue uh, up until a couple, well, not all the time, but for a few years we did. And uh, we were talking about revenue that um, I think that ranged anywhere from probably 400, 300, 400,000 up over 600,000. And we did not meet our revenue projection. We actually came from a deficit. So for the this year's budget, the current budget we're in does not include any carryover. But as you know, when we did get our audit, uh, there was carryover savings. A lot of that was due to the um, uh, budget freeze we put into place immediately, but also COVID uh, last spring contributed to that as well. So that's another thing to point out that when we start looking at the ways that we want to be able to bring the bring a responsible budget forward, uh, what do we have um, for um, tools? If we were going to be using some of that carryover, we'd want to be careful that it's not such a large number that it would um, obviously um, could be problematic. Matt, quickly, real quick question. What's the doc moving the bridge to Lafayette? Is there any? I was going to ask the exact same question. Because yeah. <clears throat> if that's what the downside to moving the bridge to Lafayette, because if there is none, I would think that would be an easy decision. Well, there's a couple of things in play here. One, we remember um, when they, the talking of all of our construction project was going, we were going to be bringing our, we were going to be um, consolidating schools. And so there would be schools coming off our books. And we'd be looking at Willard and we'd be looking at Lafayette. And so um, right now with the uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic, we have um, utilized Lafayette School this year as a partnership with the YMCA to help with families right now for those kids who when they're doing remote learning. And so uh, I know when we had our leadership team with the city last week, one of the concerns that we had was the combination of both COVID-19 and our construction projects, we probably don't want to be uh, making any plans for those buildings because they may be needed. And so if we were to need them because of COVID or if we were um, uh, needing them um, because of construction, we wouldn't need Lafayette. So that's why when you talk about moving it over there, we would. The problem, it might possibly impact some of the Y program, but as I say, the hope is that we're not gonna need that program going forward. You did hear when um, Stacy uh, Bissell presented on Monday that one of the ideas of trying to have it in the, the a bridge program, if we were to expand it, to have it all in one facility. And so that would lend itself nicely there at Lafayette, especially if we were gonna go younger kids there's a playground there already there, for example, and these are things. You did hear Don Nichols when he, we had him come in for the facilities and maintenance talk about, yeah, there's probably going to have to be some upgrades around the heating that goes into that uh, if we're thinking long term um, for it. But I also don't think we're coming into something either that is um, falling apart. Yeah, I think Matt, you're right. In the discussion back in the day about um, building the facility that we're in tonight, uh, Willard and Lafayette were part of the financial formula to pay for all of this. So, and the city, I think, is still considering the elimination of Anderson Learning. 
when Dell did, and Bridge would have to go somewhere. But that's costing us 50 grand in rent, I think, at Anderson Learning. This, that's still that calculation that probably you and city manager need to arm wrestle over a little bit behind, behind the public works behind or something. Well, that's kind of the other, the other aspect of it is it saves us 40,000 by not renting Anderson Learning. But then that puts it back on the city because now they can count that as rent. It's the same purpose. Well, they, they, would, so. they would sell that building and give it away. Well, that's, that's why you're right. It's a, it's a discussion between the school and the city as far as what we're doing with all those buildings. But that was part of the discussion yeah. seven years, eight years ago. And say that. Um, one of the things. Say that. Go back. I'll ask you after. Yeah, one of the things was. When we're talking about Anderson Learning Center, we're paying about 40,000 just for the bridge to really rent that uh, first floor, that basement floor, okay? And we're also paying uh, for a community adult education. And so between those two things, that is the majority of what is, um, you know, paying towards that. Jonathan's right that that is the city um, who owns that? So yeah, it's cost. It's it's helping us with some savings, but at the same time, it may not be helping us when it comes to <clears throat> us working collectively with the city to put forward our you know a, a budget um, to the taxpayers. So the, there's advantages there. Some of that to me would be we really want to also try to capitalize on savings that we can have by reducing outside placement special ed costs at some of our younger ages, and also see if there's some um, some tuition revenue that might be gained there. I think going there without that is probably um, not seeing a benefit other than it does help us, at least on our side on paper, but as far as the total bottom line, um, no, it really doesn't. I tend to think Willard has been making, it's more logical for us to, maintain or retain in the future than Lafayette, just from logist logistics to the new middle school, to the new K-4, just more central parking. It has a playground too. There's a lot of bridge, Altad, and maybe, not Altad, I meant uh, Altad. Yeah. And, and I know, and I know in our conversations with the city, they've also got some things that they have needs and things, and they've looked at, that that um, that land and that area for a potential new fire station. Yeah, that's been out there. But I was just wondering, Matt. You may not know off the top of your head, but you know how much are we paying at Lafayette utilities and heat to kind of just stay there? You know, is that a big expense? I'm sure it's an older HVAC system. So Where? right, La Lafayette. Yeah, so right probably, probably cost a dollar really. Yeah, right now we're able, uh, right, uh, Cheryl, that we can, that's being covered by the um, Corona Relief Funds in terms of helping us with the partnerships that we have there um, with the YMCA. So even though there are costs on that, we're not seeing that in our local budget, correct? correct. Yep, yeah, that's getting paid by the day programming CRF funds. Yeah, and do we have any idea what the, to Jonathan's question, what that cost is, uh, any ballpark on that uh, for uh, that? I'm pulling that up right now. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna mute myself so you don't hear my calculator. I guess where I'm going with that is if we're, we're saving 40,000 in rent from Anderson, but then we go back into Lafayette and we have to put 40,000 back in to cover utilities for the year, Budget-wise, it's really a wash. I mean, I think it's an advantage potentially to the bridge program, especially if it gives them some space and they can pick up a couple more tuition kids or something like that. But. Yeah, and, and understand that uh, the bridge program's current uh, location at Anderson Learning Center uh, is meeting their needs too. So I think, Don, that's a good point in terms of what we're paying for rent uh, because, uh, Cheryl, I don't think we are paying utilities at Anderson Learning Center, correct? No, I believe it's just rent, if I remember right. Yeah, so it really is a longer term discussion where you want to go and what programs you want where. So maybe Willard is the way to go. You get Lafayette off the books eventually, the city sells it. 
the bridge and adult ed going to going to Willard. Then you know Anderson Learning can be sold. You know this is all a big discussion between us and the city. And probably not one that'll be shaken out by the end of this budget season. So and sometimes less of a headache because you can just rent the space, don't have to deal with the snow, the landscaping, the, all the other stuff that goes into owning another building. Yeah. So. So the utilities last month for um, Lafayette was just under, just about $2,900 for the month. Well, year round, uh, last month's meeting. Yeah, you said Yeah, so you're probably yeah. 25 or 30. Yeah. What about the air conditioning there in the summer? Oh, wait, they don't have it. <laughs> so I think summer school, you should have it at the high school because it's a... Uh, so dehumidified in here. It's actually really nice in here in the middle of the summer. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a bigger discussion. I'm not sure we can really work that into this year's budget, or we should, because of the unknowns. Like we we can't say we're going to use Willard because come this fall, knock on wood, we don't have to. But if something happens at the elementary school, we may still need Willard. So until that all shakes out, you're not going to know. But you're going to have to find savings next year. So we're just kind of putting it on deck for the savings that you'll be able to come up with next year. Um, Would have been nice if Mark's motor to give us a deal. Or a big spot. Oh, what? That space. I don't know. It's like a sieve, so it's. Oh, does it? Yeah, I hope it can. Oh, that's not the old one. No, I'm trying to say. Hey, so Matt, when we talk about the rollover amount, how much are we projecting to have for rollover at the end of this year? Oh, funny you ask that. <laughs> <laughs> so, huh? I'm trying to do a back of the napkin today, you know, try to um, look at it real quick. Um, so, it came out to a number that I'm like, wow, that's a big number. Um, so it's right now I'm saying 101.5 million, which doesn't quite seem right. So, um, I, and well, though last year we had about the same amount of savings, so maybe it is right. So I don't know. I, I did, that's what I'm coming out with 1.5 million. I'm saying that could be, seems high. Well, just remember, and Cheryl, is that in addition to what we already had for the carryover this year? Yes. Yes. Oh, this is right. what I'm coming up with for this year. But, I mean, I think about it. We didn't pay, you know, the full amount of stipends. We didn't have to pay a lot of electricity to have the fields out in out up at night, which is fairly expensive. That's like $15,000 a year. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff adds up. So, um, I mean, I'm still looking at it. I'm just not 100% sure 1.5 million seems a bit high to me. So. If that is the case, that's like, that almost makes this a much easier process because I'm not sure, like I wouldn't roll a full hundred, uh, one and a half million in the next year. You could use a chunk of that to get that percentage down I wouldn't even be talking about it until you're sure about it. Sure. Yeah, I, yeah, you definitely need to verify and get a feel different, super conservative. Yeah, get a different napkin, sure. Well, I still think, <laughs> I, think we're, I think we need to. <laughs> I think the napkin's <laughs> You need a bigger napkin. Um, also, no, also, it's February, right? So we still got, you know, we're only, um, you know, we're not even two thirds through yet. Um, as well. So I, I you know, I, I think we've been very, um, everyone's worked hard and we've been very prudent uh, to, um, to look at that as far as trying to be uh, savings and wherever we can and, and leverage the Corona relief funds. You just saw Joan come in with her budget and how she's trying to stretch those dollars. So I have those pieces. To me, uh, I think that there's going to be a part that probably should have some carryover be part of our revenue. But I also think for where we sit right now, we may want to take another look 
um, and see if there are any other positions or things that might be some things. And, and we're at a point where everything's impactful. We know that. I've said that. But I also are thinking that there might have to be a combination to get that 4.5% down. I think it's going to be, uh, I don't think it would be wise to really look at that as being solely with carryover. I think we also want to see if we can find some other potential cuts or savings to bring that down um, as well. And so we're working hard at that. I don't have anything ready to present tonight. I know we had a, um, with our uh, 18 meeting this week, uh, we focused uh, really on two things, budget and how we might be able to still find some savings. And the other thing we focused on was increasing our in-person learning uh, and doing that for, um, for this school year. So I'm not ready, I think, tonight, but I think for our next budget workshop, uh, we might be able to bring something in to at least have some ideas and some things to consider um, and see if we can come up. I don't know how the committee feels about that, but um, that would be my recommendation that we try to look at this, still trying to see if there's some um, any decreases or cuts we can make. Well, I was just going to say, I wonder if we want to kind of strategy-wise here, try to come up, like you said, Matt, find a few more reductions, try to end up in the, the three and a half to four range to go to the budget committee with, and then as it goes through the budget committee, if they're looking to provide the taxpayers with more relief, maybe that's when we tap into the rollover and say, hey, we're comfortable taking a couple hundred thousand dollars of this rollover and put it as revenue to lower that, that tax impact based off of where the, the budget committee wants to end up. Because that's, that's a big question now. And I know a lot of people are being impacted by the pandemic. There's people losing their jobs. You know, are they going to be okay with a 3% increase? Or are they going to want 2% or, you know, maybe even 1%? I mean, I think that's really short-sighted, but you never know how that process is going to play out. So you kind of need to have that in the back of your mind as to how you'll how we'll react to that. So how does everybody else think about I Hillary? Agree. I think Matt. Yeah, I think Matt needs to just come back to us with some more ideas. And he's he's the one in the trenches where I'm not. And I won't say anybody else is but I'm not. So I, I look to your guidance now. Please, how does everybody feel about where we should be coming in? with what we go to the, the budget committee with kind of as a percentage increase. Because that's really where the discussion always kind of ends up. Well, it shouldn't really be one of what cost of living adjustment is, right? And let's just say it's 2% this year. Yeah. So I think you're roughly there at 1.8 if you roll back the bond number. So I yeah. think you can argue that. It's not a bad starting point, which was the uh, 4.5. Yeah, I think you can start there and, and try to argue the bond. Um, I, but that's where I would start. So you think we're in kind of a decent spot now already? Yep. Yeah. And if Matt finds a few other things, drop a point, you know, a quarter point, half a point. But, you know, they, that puts us in the wheelhouse. As I said in my email, I think we're in a better spot this year from a Budget committee and city council. That I think we got more people on those committees that are more pro school. Well, it's it, 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 yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, one of the things that I think one of the emails that gave me your call and asked budget related was what specifically does the school committee want to do? And I think one of the areas that I, I was interested in what programs. Um, Kathy Sargent shared some stuff with Amy and I, and all of you, I think you saw that, what programs had a certain number of, what's the student-teacher ratio, and I know I always pick on Latin, I don't pick on it, I don't understand it, but if there's only eight kids, eight students in, in a certain class, why do we continue with that? Or should we be sharing an online learning opportunity with Noble or Indian Township or wherever it is? in Montana, but those are the things, that's my thinking, and I, I talk like I know what I'm talking about, but I don't actually, but you know that. But how do we share services 
with all the technology we have today. And, and I think with one of you that said, we, we, aren't, we aren't talking about names of positions, we're talking about the, the course, course description, <laughs> which ones due to cost, cost need to be eliminated. But and we, what should we add? So well, you're talking about not even eliminating, but can we do it in a different way? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it always comes down to me. It's kind of what Jonathan said. What's the least impact to the students? And is there a different way to do it, still providing for the students, but cheaper? And if not, then you know how do you save that money impacting the least number of kids? So. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've done is uh, we were looking ahead um, to see uh, if um, coming from the pandemic, if there was any remote learning opportunities. And so we did start conversations uh, with an area school and we had there were meetings uh, and we reached a level where it started at a central office level and central administrators level. Then we brought in even our uh, various high schools. And it sounds like it's a, and it is a good idea and it sounds like it's easy, but boy, there has to be a ton of planning that goes into that because our systems are not, uh, they're similar, but they're not alike. And like uh, Joan gave you a good idea there about just when the schedule starts and when people are available and when they can come in and do that. Some small little things, but remember, we're not, uh, it, it's uh, without getting that, all that planning for it, it doesn't just automatically come together and fit perfectly. And I'm not, I know that comes off as sounding like an excuse, but that's our reality that there's going to be some challenges to get going on that a little bit that um, that to me is more stuff down the line than it's probably going to be here in the next week or two for us to be able to offer up some of those savings and and um, I wish that wasn't the case I think, but reality. Maybe you had a question. Well I guess I'm now that I have a freshman and uh, now I'm seeing it a little bit differently. Like when I kept hearing bad drop, bad drop, I'm like it was just kind of went in and out. But now that I'm seeing it, like, you know, with him and his friends that like, oh, one class is a little difficult. So they want to drop it. So what happens when you're like three weeks, two weeks into the school and then you've got six or eight kids dropping it. And now you do have a small class, but that wasn't what it was looking like two or three weeks before. Mm. So when we go to look at it through a paper, you know, at the papers, I'm like, oh, why does this class only have this many? Well, what I'm learning from my own kids is that it's because some are all are up, and I think it's probably a bigger question of why are people, and that was kind of what I was saying to Kathy when we met was, are you noticing a similar program that is just not getting this, you know, the high numbers the second year or kids are dropping it because maybe that's a bigger conversation. Um, but I did start to kind of see it with my own, through my own eyes, I guess, why they may have some classes with much you, smaller. You're experiencing it. Yeah. You live in it. Yeah. Because like right now, or I think, and I just saw it on Facebook about, oh, you know, ad drop is coming up. And I was like trying to, you know, get my own kid to get, well, get his stuff. Yeah. Well, Matt, I would think with your, your superintendent colleagues and the Department of Education have to be thinking about shared services instead of just lip service. I would think the state at some point in time is going to say, if you don't start sharing, we're going to reduce your funding. Well, they have, John. Yeah, I would have. They have, and I've mentioned okay. that. Remember, we're part of a regional service center, and remember that has helped the, the state. They didn't call it, uh, in essence, they called it an incentive, but you also could have taken the position that it was a penalty. penalty. And so by us uh, being part of that Southern Maine Regional Service Center, that has helped us uh, receive significant funding to take advantage of that. Now we're meeting as a regional service center to say, where are those things that we can easily consolidate services? And so we talked about that when Beth Lambert was doing her presentation about some of the curriculum resources. Hey, if we're doing NWAA, and everyone else in the Southern Maine Regional Service Center is, maybe we could get more buying power 
by coming in to be able to do that. So we're starting to expand those things, but it's, it's, it's a process. Uh, right now, um, we're looking at um, heating oil contracts. The issue is all of our contracts come up at different times. You also have the big local aspect that people work with people in their own uh, uh, businesses, in their own communities. So there's, it's, it's, there's a lot of challenges to it, but I think we're heading the right direction. And I think the state has been supportive of that. They realize some of the challenges, so it's not coming back to be really heavy handed, but it's coming back saying, hey, the models we have are not sustainable. We have to continue to find ways to cut our expenses and also see if there's ways that we can increase revenues. And so we're on to something. It's just something that is going to have to, it, it's something that we continue to build upon. It is interesting um, with this, the Zoom room that was talked about, that I had never heard of that, like coming here, and I thought that that was really interesting. And I, you know, I go along with your Latin, because, you know, it's Latin, 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 Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell my sister I said that, they didn't all the time. Um, <laughs> um, but the, like getting back to like the classes that are, are small, and I think you would ask like, oh, so could you go and basically Zoom? Like AP courses. Let yeah, and, and, and you all, like you've got the six kids, I'm just talking out lavishly, yeah, but like if you have the six kids that want to take Latin, um, <laughs> Latin, and you know they all come into a classroom they use the zoom board and they're all in class together but they're being taught by the instructor that maybe would have taught at Biddeford two uh -huh. hours before but it's popping in yeah. I do wonder when that gets I'm sure there'll be cakes and all that like sure. that's perfect but there's so much college um classes that are doing something similar right yeah. now in like different sort of like um you know when I go to get CEUs for nursing, I can kind of click on different ones at different times, but I'm getting that's, the same information. That's it. Yeah, but I do wonder, you know, if that's an opportunity for next year because this Zoom board is going to be coming in, that we look at like the seniors, and I guess this would be really have to be more for seniors no, or juniors. Sure, sure. Well, I can't see my freshman who is super immature <laughs> sitting well, in a class and with this with with other students yeah. without an adult in the room. Now, yeah. It's really going to be geared towards you the kids have to that be, are motivated. Yeah. Is that, maybe I'm wrong. I just yeah, can't yeah. see my freshman doing that. I can do older older kids doing that. I don't know. I see older kids being able to handle it. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, or, that, or that says a lot about my ADHD son, but I don't know. I mean, I think your kids could do it. Well, some of them could. <laughs> but actually, but look at it. We're talking, I know we're talking globally now, big picture, but we're talking about saving money. But let's think about enhancing what could we yeah. bring into the district. Yeah. But also, the you know, teacher that, not to cut you off, but like, the teacher that would have maybe been teaching those six students or eight students could then be offering another class to fit more with the four block schedule for other kids. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure this is something you guys are already talking about doing all that. It's just great, 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 great ideas. I, I do want to say though that uh, I think it's all great ideas and I think it's, it's the way of the future. Like Matt said, the, the systems that we have in place right now are just not sustainable anymore. But I hear you, Matt, when you say that it, it's going to take a tremendous amount of planning. Tremendous amount of planning because you're right. You can't just fold the page over and everything falls into place, you know, from one school to the next. So, but if we aren't, if, if we aren't pushing, oh, no, yeah, it's never going to happen. That's the letters, the, the emails we're getting from parents. Yeah. If we aren't, you know, Matt can hear us, right? What if, so, what if we started smaller? It's, like trying to, like Amy said, nothing is perfect and there's going to be lots of kinks, but what if we just started within this building? Sure. Yeah, that, yeah. We could be a leader and teach other schools how to do it. Yeah. And then maybe, you know, a few years down the road or whatever, then we, as other schools change and maybe everything sort of falls more on the same plane, then, okay, we've got the same schedule yeah. you do. So, I think you're getting into what another part of the discussion too when you say, you're talking about having a classroom where there's, the kids are here. You don't have an adult 
they're responsible for getting their class going up there and all that. That's a paradigm change in and of itself that you could have a group of kids in the building that don't need direct adult supervision, which I think you have a number of kids that can do that, but that hasn't been the culture. It's like, oh, they need to have a teacher there. There needs to be somebody there to supervise there them. Ha there has but, been, but they're getting, but they're getting college credit. There's a lot of kids that are well, getting college credit, so they are kind of doing it. No, I'm saying as far as like just supervision, you're talking staff and so we're talking right. budget stuff. Yeah. You know, is there a certain population that, you know, these kids are good kids, they're dedicated self to learning, self-starters? Yeah. <laughs> you can tell them, hey, you're taking Latin. It's in this Zoom room. You go in there, somebody's, you know, one of the kids starts it, or even somebody just pops in and starts it, but you don't necessarily need an adult there with them. Don, you know, um, I, mean, I, I got to speak up. I'm I'm starting, I was just going to tell you that. I'm starting I'm sure to I'm starting to twitch when you start talking about no adult supervision for our school, and I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's my own children or someone else. That is, uh, I, I get worried. I think we may have to start to leverage a, a, a space where there might be one person who can be able to help and do that and still leverage that. But as far as us turning that into, in some ways, a college campus or some things. That's that that worries me. I have to speak up with that just on some of the conversations that we're dealing with and having uh, in terms of some of the um, uh, student incidents and discipline that comes up. It's just those are some real liability situations that we're putting ourselves into that really give me that really make me nervous. So I just had to say that I could see I think I could see probably Steve doing the same thing in terms of uh, on our end here uh, for that. So I think we've got to look at ways like the Zoom room and some of those things that we have where it can be staffed, but it can be a way where we're leveraging more and more areas so that you can come back and say, that expense is really getting a lot of impact for where it's coming back in to do it more than multiple ways, rather than just keeping it singular for one particular class maybe or something that way. Uh, to be able to do that it's nothing that we can't do by putting some headphones on and and some other things uh, i think to be able to help around it so i'm sorry don but i wanted to speak up on that before we got too far down that road that's good i went too far off the reservation that, that we were just trying to prove an example you left us unattended and that's <laughs> what you <got. laughs> So this is where we're talking about doing things differently and creatively and a little outside the box. And that's what we're going to have to do. We're, we're going to need to do that. I think some of the things that we're talking about are years ago, we might have been able to get away when there was a class that had six people in it. But nowadays, as we've looked at it, that's where it becomes harder and harder to justify. And so that's where uh, I think we've got to, and, you know, I think, um, that's probably when we look at it is where is the where are we getting the impact and where is it not and those are some of the things that we have to look at uh, to do it can i just just me not really i'm just still learning yet we know. so <laughs> so when we go back i wish i had like could have printed i should go back into all my emails and like try to print that one slide so when we go back to like the original budget meeting when there was the needs that sheet were like the knees that staff were saying we would love this. And it said, Ed Techs, like I felt so strongly about getting Ed Techs to help those kindergarten teachers next year yeah. because the behaviors that they are going to get from these kids is going to be out of control. So, I mean, when we talk about that, is that been on your end being like, is it going to be justified? Are we able to justify it with the COVID fund, the COVID relief funds for the next three years? I know that that's a separate conversation to have afterwards, but I don't, I, like, I feel so strongly about that being added for them because the behaviors of the little ones who have been home on iPads for so long is, is a real, real thing. Yeah. Well, it does kind of fit in this conversation a little bit because if it isn't going to be able to be covered in the federal funds, right. it means now would be the time to push to get some. And, and, I, under, and I, 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 I hear everybody loud and clear about the cliff, the cliff, the cliff, the cliff, the cliff. I, I get it. But I do feel like we are at the cliff 
and in the sense of like what next school year these kids are coming in with their behaviors and so He's yeah, Matt's got it up for you. Okay, mind. yeah. So it's really small. But. When Matt changed the screen, I thought he had shut off. And like, he just left. <laughs> I, I pushed Matt over the head. And I was talking about just letting the kids do whatever they want here. He left. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't understand the left. Bobby. I don't know if I'm just talking to you in the car. Yeah, so I think. Yeah, so <laughs> I think Amy's right. I think we do have to look at that idea of we've talked about a cliff and and what part of my uh, reasoning for being able to present that was to show the dangers. But I also do think that we do have to have some things that we front load with these federal funds, realizing that it's a short term intervention. I think that's needed. And so that's going to be part of our other conversation is where do we have those discussions to see what positions uh, we feel that are not in this budget that are going to be needed for us to best meet the needs of our kids because there we we always have needs every year now coming back out of COVID-19 it's going to be a, a especially different with that so I haven't updated this this is a, a one that as you go through it, for example, the allied arts teacher at the middle school. Right now, that's something that's been put in there um, for that. Remember, we at the high school, we had an additional art teacher. I think we're able to also cross that one off the list as well uh, to be able to do that. And so then there's some of the others here that these are the lists that as we uh, went through the budget process, these were positions uh, that we looked at to say it doesn't include them, but boy, wouldn't it be nice if we did, if it did. I agree with Amy, and maybe we ought to do this on the other uh, his second discussion with the, those funds. I truly believe, and I believe that prior to the COVID, that the early education, we, we really need to spend a lot of our resources because of our demographics. This coming these coming years is even more so. So, right, we've been saying that for many years that that's where we want to spend our funds. So, this moving forward, I really think that has to be our focus. And the truth is that if we concentrate those changes, or not concentrate all the changes, but if we put a lot of focus on the elementary school, as far as these, you know, COVID cliff with the behavior issues and the emotional and the mental and everything, it's only going to help us down the road mm -hmm. when these kids go into middle school and then when they go into high school, need less services. Yeah. But in talking about the cliff, I, I, I look at those positions that we add them in from the COVID funds. I, I don't want to look at them. I want to look at them as a three year position, yeah, right. a yeah, two year yeah. position. Yeah. So in knowing full well going in, we're going to have issues. We all know we're going to have issues with the younger children, and we have to put our best foot forward and spend the funds in those levels with those younger kids, knowing that three years from now, COVID's going to be so far. Right. I want to believe so far in the rearview mirror. Can I? Discussions. Can you just yeah, zoom? Absolutely. Can you zoom into this? I have good eyes, but I can't. So, if we were to get rid of, I'm just if we were to add it all, okay, and we were minus the two the art teachers it would be i can't even read that bottom line uh, 1.4 million so, without so the art that's teachers, that 100. so that's the one million of the three years already spent without summer school right so well, there's other positions in there that yeah that's not all okay, okay. Stuff. So, so, the stuff on so let's just cut it in half to make easy number that's five hundred thousand right so yeah, you're probably right. right. So um pretty good with numbers. Um just by the can't look at that Um <laughs> so talking about summer school, and I'll probably shop for saying this. When you think about the amount of kids that will attend, will attend daily, will come ready to learn. I've actually had a kid that attended summer school within the past couple of years because of needing title one and whatnot i wonder if we get more use of our money to put to front load it starting in september mm -hmm. than 
spending all this extra money for kids that may or may not come, needing buses, needing this, needing that during the summertime. Especially not knowing where we're going to be with COVID precautions, three feet, this, that, and the other. I just, I, it's just an, a, an idea because I know that there's been no, a lot of time. It's, it's a good yeah, valid point. I, I just, I know for, for my own eyeballs that I saw it that year, and we decided not to do it the following year for many various reasons, but sometimes a lot of the behaviors are there as well. So the staffing learning is less. I'm not trying to give it's everybody did a wonderful job. But when you have behaviors in certain classrooms, the education that was intended to be done is not done. And so I wonder if having more staff, more ed techs, more hands on smaller ratios um, with special ed and in the regular ed classrooms might be more bang for our buck in the sense of trying to get education in what you know, they lost. I, to add to that too, I, you know, how many kids are going to want to go to school this summer, and how many parents? Because right now, everybody's like, he's just done. Well, they're going to want them there because their kids are well. You know yeah, what I mean? You know what I mean? And I'm not. I mean, no judgment, but that's one of the reasons. But, but it's some, sometimes it's the parents have to be like, "Are you kidding me? We're going to do more school? Like after all of this, we all need a break." Yeah, I was thinking maybe just sending them back to the record. You know, right. well, that's where I think Matt's talking about making it not yeah. a traditional summer school. And I think you're making a really valid point about balancing what you do for summer school versus the expense of it and what you can get more out of you get more out of later in the school year when you know the kids are going to be there. Um, so I think as Matt's putting that summer school proposal together. That's definitely something to think about. Like, you know, what we kind of capture are you going to get? Right. And is it going to be worth the expenditure? Better care is when you have smaller ratios, right? A nurse having five patients, a nurse having two patients, and three patients, better care all day long, same as in education and with teaching. I mean, you can get more done with smaller ratios. Yeah. And so that's, I guess. I, I still think there's going to be this need for kids that are way behind. Like if you can get them to do some stuff over the summer, even if it's a small population, so they hit the ground running in September, you know, there's gotta be a win there. But I agree with you 100% about watching how much you spend on that summer program, if that money could have more bang for the buck yeah, more the rest of the year. And maybe you so. do that with smaller Zooms, you do smaller Zooms. So, you know, you do one teacher, they keep their devices, they do one and they do small groups and you hire a, some teachers for first grade, kindergarten, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and they work on the reading on this day on math. And then you've got them for the hour and a half, pay the teacher that stipend, yeah. but everybody's in the luxuries of their home and you're saving a lot of money. Yeah. That'll be interesting to see what Matt comes up with for a proposal. Yeah. So, no, I, so I, that's I, how yeah, and I, I think we've got to also take uh, leverage points where we can be able to make the most impact um, with that. And sometimes you, you can overshoot things in a summer program when you don't know what the numbers are going to be. Whereas in the school year, you have a pretty good idea and putting those resources there tend to have, you'll have more buy-in in situations like that. I was just worried to make sure that the feedback we had a couple meetings ago was make sure summer school's robust. And so and to, to hear that, we wanted to say, listen, it can't be the old, same old summer school that we all went to. It has to, or at least I did. I can't speak for everyone. Maybe John went too. Um, we can, uh, you know, look at it to say um, we've got to come at it with a different, a different viewpoint. I think we're all also worried about our kids falling behind. Uh, and, and, and when we know that we want to intervene and do what we can there quickly. And sometimes that may not be the best use of the funding that we have to get that best leverage point. That's why I think working with the rec program and maybe even reaching out to some of the larger childcare programs in, in the city and operating like part of the day to get that educational component because yes. you know yeah. the kids are going to be there. So it's not like you're making them come into the school. Right. And to where they are. You would make their lives a little bit easier too, because then they're being taught by yeah. somebody else. Well, and like I think Beth, when she was talking about it, was talking about the bookmobile ideas, you know, getting like a couple of bookmobiles to go out. So, because I'm sure a lot of kids, you know, they just don't have the books, so they're not going to read the summer. But if you make it kind of fun and exciting, 
then you get out there to them. Stack it up like an ice cream truck. And exactly. Yeah. You play the ice cream truck music, so you trick them. They think it's an ice cream truck because they hear the music. They come, and then there's books. I'll go and make a freeze pop. You better give them something because I'm not covering a book folio. Give them a freeze pop when they're coming. See, is my daughter weird because she's more excited about the books than I the, wish my the kids ice cream. I've so. got a couple readers. That's too funny. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, anybody else have anything else you'd like to scare Matt with? Or, yeah. You're doing a great job, Matt. You are. You're doing Keep it up. Keep it up. I know we're giving you a lot of many strokes. It's okay. Jeez. We're just spitballing here, Matt. Just throwing right. stuff out there, trying to do our jobs. So you just shouldn't leave us alone. Like um, this. Hey, do you have anything else for us, Matt? No, I don't. Um, no, I do. Um, one thing tonight, uh, we want to get a. I want to get a message out about the um, the food uh, pickup tomorrow night uh, that the backpack program is doing, and um, also um, would like a couple of you to look at a survey. We'd like to also get out uh, to our parents uh, and families tonight as well, if possible. So, I think we can. Uh, <laughs> I think we're ready to adjourn. Okay. Yeah. Motion for adjourned. Very good. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Rubin, the motion. Jonathan seconded it. All in favor? Yeah. Yep. All in favor.